social media. God bless. Good morning, Christ Church. God bless you. Thank you for your worship. Thank you for your presence today. I want to say right in the camera, look right in the camera and say to Rustin and Sterling Church family, we love you guys so much. And everybody online, thank God you're joining us today. Everybody here at West Monroe, God bless all of you. Thank you for your faithfulness. I just want to get ready to get started in the message. But before I do, uh, I want to just make you aware of a couple things uh, that maybe you haven't already heard. Um, thank you to all of you who labored so faithfully for KidsCon these past Tuesday, Wednesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever it was. Um, 22 uh, students got baptized after KidsCon. Thank God for that. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Lord. Beautiful, beautiful time. So much effort, energy. Thank you for all of you who participated in that. And uh, also to all of our uh, Summer in the Psalms speakers, our uh, pastoral staff did a phenomenal job. Aren't you thankful for such capable leaders among us? What a great job they did. And then two weeks ago, Fabian Greck, if you were here, Fabian Greck was in the service, our missionary to Iraq. And at the conclusion of the service, I just asked, hey, why don't we let Fabian know that we believe in what he's doing. Let's speak with our wallets. And in that, those services that quick, you guys so generous raised $25,000 and sent back to Iraq with Fabian. Come on, somebody. Thank you. Thank you. Hats off. Thank you for your generous giving. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love for the work of God around the world. Matthew chapter six, if you have your Bibles, we are living in unprecedented days, as you know, when, as Paul wrote to the Romans in the first chapter of Romans, saying, in, in those days, people will consider it foolish to acknowledge God. They'll consider it foolish to acknowledge God. Their lives will be filled with every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, envy, hate, murder, deception, malicious behavior, that they would hate God. They'd be proud and boastful, inventing new ways of sinning, right? We're living there. And they would encourage others to live lives without restraints. And then he concludes chapter one of Romans with this last verse, verse 32. I wanna read it to you from the Message Paraphrase Bible. And it says, and it's not as if they don't know better. They know perfectly well they're spitting in God's face. And they don't care. Worse, they hand out prizes to those who do the worst things best. Who do the worst things best. I don't know if there's ever been a time in history when more prayer is more needed. But when people are less inclined to pray. Prayer is an unnatural human activity from the time we're born. They, we cut the core, we begin the process of our independence. We learn lessons about walking and talking and, and hot and cold and, and love and hate. And we, we learn all these experiences in life. And somewhere in the educational process, you'll hear, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. And in that message, it's the whole mantra, whatever you can believe you can achieve, if you, if you just muscle your way through, if you'll apply enough energy and effort, if you'll be disciplined enough, you can make it if you try. And so it's in that kind of individualistic process and thought process that in our American culture, American culture especially, that we become hyper-independent. It seems almost alien to us that we should depend on anyone for anything. I don't need it. I got it. I got this. I can handle this. I'm my own man. No, we're rugged. We're individual. We can make it. We can handle it. We're independent. We, we're, we can do it on our own. And with all that said... It's no surprise that our culture sees prayer as a last resort. Maybe you heard about the Christian man who took his atheist buddy fishing, hoping to lead him to faith in Christ. They were fishing in Arkansas Lake when all of a sudden they were just having a deep conversation about faith in God. And all of a sudden, the Loch Ness Monster just emerges right under the boat, throws the boat 100 feet in the air, swallows the boat, the tackle, the tackle box, the rod and reel, and each of the buddies grabs a limb, holding on for dear life. And the atheist friend said, oh, God, please save us. To which his Christian buddy said, dude, I thought you didn't believe in God. He said, dude, I didn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster 15 seconds ago. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Prayer only works if you believe it. It only works if you have faith. 
But without faith, you're on your own. God invites us into this dynamic interaction with him and he gives us some priorities that we need to develop in our lives if we're going to enjoy this beautiful relationship with God. He, he invites us into his presence and he tells us how to do it. That's what we're gonna talk about today because developing right priorities is 100% vital to every facet of our lives. For example, we need to, we need to develop health priorities if we wanna live long, healthy lives. If we're gonna be able to meet our monthly financial obligations, we have to have financial priorities, right? Come on, somebody. Or at the end of the month, you're gonna still have some bills that are unmet and no money to meet them. If we wanna have healthy homes and marriages, we have to prioritize and, and pour into those children and our families, our marriages. Pour. How many of you say amen to that? Our, our spiritual lives are no different. If we wanna grow in our relationship with God, if we wanna be able to stand against the fierce attack of Satan on our homes and families and maintain our position in Christ no matter what comes our way, no matter what circumstances may surround us, we have to make prayer a priority. We're gonna embrace the idea of intentionality if we're gonna develop a life that flourishes in communion with God. There, there's no greater expert in the arena of prayer than the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody prayed like Jesus. Nobody believed in the power of prayer as much as Jesus did. Let me share this from a daily devotional I've used through the years. It's by Henry Blackaby, it's an Experiencing God devotional. He writes, it was common knowledge among the disciples that they would find Jesus praying during the, during the early morning hours. When they needed him, they knew to go first to the place of prayer. When Judas betrayed Jesus, he led his cohorts to Jesus' place of prayer. Every time Jesus faced an important decision, he prayed. When he was being tempted to do things by the world's method instead of his father's, he prayed. When it was time to choose his disciples, he prayed all night long. It was prayer that set the agenda for Jesus' ministry. Prayer preceded miracles. Prayer brought him encouragement at critical moments. Prayer enabled him to go to the cross and prayer kept him there despite the excruciating pain. Prayer was a vital, important in the life of Jesus. And I would think as Christ followers, then certainly prayer ought to be vitally important to us as well. So the disciples saw firsthand the depth and the quality, the life and power in Jesus praying. And they were wise enough to say, thank God they did because now we have his answer. Lord, we wanna know how to pray like you pray. Teach us how to pray. And then Jesus lost into the Lord's prayer. And so we pick up in Matthew chapter six, verse five. I'll read these next three verses of scripture to you. And then we're gonna look at uh, what was in there. Verse five, when Jesus teaching Sermon on the Mount, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I'll tell you the truth, that's all the reward they will ever get. Now, I just wanna tell you, I, I don't want the rewards of my praying to be a few pats on the back. Somebody said, man, that was a good prayer. You prayed really, that was a powerful prayer. And then it ends there. No, I want to get the answer to what I'm praying for. That's all they'll ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. Verse seven, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him, even before you ask even before you ask. Then he gives this effective model of prayer, the Lord's Prayer. In that short span of scripture between verses five and eight, there are four timeless truths that Jesus gives us about prayer. Four things that Jesus wanted us to know. If we're going to develop the kind of priorities in prayer that we need to have, four things that will unlock this beautiful and vibrant relationship with God that he longs to enjoy with us. So let's jump right in. Everybody ready? Say amen. First thing is this, if you're taking notes, write this down. Pray often or pray frequently. Pray frequently. Verse five again, when you pray. This is the advice that Jesus gives. He's assuming that these earliest followers of his would follow his footsteps. When you pray, when you pray. It wasn't a foreign concept to them. As a matter of fact, he's teaching this whole passage 
and about prayer and fasting and giving. And so the implication is really clear. He doesn't say if you pray or if you fast or if you give. No, he says when you do those things, when you do. His followers, he was teaching them that fasting and prayer and giving are the norms in the area of Christian disciplines. It wasn't just for the few who may have been standing around Jesus on that day, but for us as well, that the disciples, as disciples of Jesus Christ, it's assumed that we too will have frequent times of prayer. So I wanna challenge every single one of us, whether you're at the West Monroe campus here, Ruston's uh, church or Sterling church, or online, I challenge you to develop a regular time of prayer. Become a person of prayer. Maybe you're thinking right now, well, I just don't have enough hours in the day to have a regular time of prayer. Listen, nobody gets 31 hours, nobody gets 27 hours. We all get 24 hours. And this is what I've learned in 64 years. I kind of make time for the things I want to do. I'm guessing the same is true for everybody listening to me right now. What we prioritize gets our attention. And let me also say this, whatever you wanna be good at, it's gonna take some time. So someone said, if you wanna be good at basketball, you've gotta to touch the ball a thousand times a day, dribbling, passing, shooting. You're not gonna get bas- good at basketball sitting on the couch, eating popcorn, watching somebody else dribble up and down the court making layups. Nope, if you wanna get good at basketball, you gotta to touch the ball. You gotta get with it, get moving. Anything in life, you can apply that across the board. We've all heard people uh, pray out loud in a public setting. We thought, man, I wish I could pray like that. The truth is that wasn't that person's first prayer. As a matter of fact, it wasn't their first prayer in public or in private. They learned to pray by praying. Again, the reality is that if you want to be good at anything, you've got to put the time into it. And if you want to learn to pray, you've got to take the time to pray. Because without a commitment to frequent times of prayer, it's not gonna happen. The real tragedy is this, you can't even imagine all you're missing. If you're not praying, you can't imagine what you're missing. God has something beautiful and awesome for every one of us in the avenue of prayer. So choose a time, make it non-negotiable, put the brakes on your busy life and pray. Pray frequently, choose to become a person of prayer. As a matter of fact, in preparation to our summer revival that's coming up in about 10 days, um, we, we are beginning this weekend on Friday afternoon here at the West Monroe campus in the quad, we'll begin 24 hours of prayer between the campuses. So West Monroe, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Sterling will pick up at 6 a.m. and pray till noon. Russell will pick up at noon and pray till Saturday evening at six. I just want you to, listen, I'm always uh, asking people to put their phone away, but I'm gonna ask you to take your phone out. Take your phone out. And just, uh, there'll there'll be a QR code on the screen. You can click that QR code and just put your name and take a slot, take an hour and say, you know what? I'm going to be faithful to pray. We need revival in North Louisiana. We need revival in our families. I want to ask you to say how many of you got kids or grandkids that are away from God or living their own life or doing their own thing. Looks like they put God in the rear view mirror. But we got those kind of things going on in our life. We have health issues. We got financial issues. We got career issues. We got every kind of issue that you can imagine, why should we not be those people who say, I'm gonna set a time aside and I'm gonna go to the church with other believers and spend time in prayer. I'm believing for hundreds of people across three locations to say, yes, Pastor Tom, we're gonna pray for the summer revival. We're gonna pray for lost people around us. We're gonna pray for the person in the cubicle at work that doesn't know God. I'm gonna pray for my own kids. I'm gonna set the time aside and do that. We'll have prayer resources. There'll be words on the screen. There'll be music playing. You grab a friend, grab a friend, say, hey, I'm going at such and such hour. Why don't you come go with me and let's do this together in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody. Say amen. 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 So pray frequently. Second thing that Jesus teaches in this passage is pray in private. He says, go away by yourself. Shut the door. Pray to your father in private. Then he'll reward you openly. Don't be like the spiritual wannabes, in other words, who want to try to convince people of their spiritual superiority by their overt, over-the-top prayers that are meant, listen, less for God to hear and more for their neighbor to hear. How far is that prayer going to get? 
I'm praying so you'll think I'm really spiritual. I'm praying so you'll listen to me and give me a pat on the back. I'm, not, I'm praying so you'll hear me, not so God will hear me. Prayer is not a public showcase for our spirituality. It's not about trying to impress people around us. Look at verse five from the Message Paraphrase Bible, Matthew six and verse five. And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production. All these people are making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for 15 minutes of fame. You think God sits in a box seat? In other words, it's not some performance. Listen carefully so you don't leave misunderstanding. Jesus is not issuing a prohibition against praying in public. He's warning against a showy, prideful attitude when we pray in public. There are times that call for public prayer, public events, meals, family devotions, corporate worship service, even praying for one another or praying in a group setting. So there are many times that we should pray publicly, but never in a way that somehow garners attention for ourselves or kudos for ourselves. And it should never be done in, in, as a substitute for the intimate, personal, one-on-one -on -one time we're gonna spend alone with God. One of the big reasons God wants you to pray privately is he wants you to remove all the distractions from your life so that you can pour out your, the secrets of your heart to God and just say anything you want to say without listening ears and then be still enough to listen to his voice in return. So you got to find that place where all the distractions are gone. You need a place where your heart can get quiet, a safe place where you feel vulnerable before God and not before everybody else. I've learned from the recommendations of others through the years and one lesson I've learned that fits my situation is this. I have to differentiate between my place of prayer and study from the place I watch TV. So I've got a recliner where I watch TV and then there's another room off the side. There's a sofa and a lamp that I can turn on early in the morning and have a cup of coffee and my Bible and a journal and spend some time alone with God in prayer. I don't do that where I watch TV. Y'all you know, tracking with me, say amen. There's a special place that I made my place of prayer. Sometimes it is in my vehicle. Sometimes I just get in my truck. Just turn some worship music on and spend some time alone with God in prayer. Sometimes I'll sneak back to the chapel. Nobody even knows I'm back there. Spend some time with prayer, with God in prayer. And those areas become a sanctuary. I recognize it's different for everyone, but for me, I'll, I'll grab my Bible and a notebook that I, I journal in. And my notebook, there are printed prophetic words that have been spoken over me over the course of my ministry life. And there are typewritten courses. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Things that I can just sing the, the line or two of a course that just puts me right in the presence of the Lord. Beautiful times of God. I make a list of prayer priorities so that I can stay focused and be reminded of what I need to bring before God in prayer and so that I can revisit later to celebrate God's answers. Those are the most important parts of my life. And I never want to go without spending those times connected with God. You might say, well, that's a pastor's thing. Pastors are supposed to do stuff like that. No, no, let me tell you, that's a Christ follower thing. I'm a Christ follower first. Come on, somebody. And then I, I, I'm a pastor beyond that. It's not just for some spiritual leader in the church. We're all leading somebody. You're leading your families. Prayers for every single one of us to carve out time where we can pour our hearts out to God in private prayer and allow God to pour his heart into ours. So pray frequently, pray in private. Here's the third thing, pray with sincerity. Jesus said, don't babble on and on like people of other religions do. They're pagans, they think their prayers are answered merely by repetition, saying the same words over and over again. Jesus said, don't use vain repetition, don't babble. I think babbling and vain repetition is a lot more easy than we ever dreamed. As a matter of fact, I'm probably guilty of it uh, more times than I care to admit. Let me clarify again. Jesus is not teaching against repetition in prayer. Praying about the same thing again. You prayed about it yesterday. Somebody said, well, you prayed about that yesterday. You're, you're living in a lack of faith if you pray for it again. No, I'm sorry. You can read the, the gospels and Jesus will talk to you about importunity in prayer. Keep on asking, like the woman and the unjust judge. She just kept on knocking, kept on asking. Jesus said, knock and you shall receive. And the implication there in the Greek is knock and keep on knocking. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. That's not what Jesus is talking about. 
He's talking about vain repetition. Here's a good working definition. Mindless words and Christian cliches. How often when we take time to pray do we just kind of string certain religious sounding words together and call it prayer. Certain phrases sound so spiritual, they sound so right. We just put them all together in a sentence and throw it up there and say, okay, I prayed, I call it done. But Jesus encourages us to think about the words that we're speaking. Think about it. Make sure it's from the heart. None of us talk to each other with a, uh, tired, religious sounding expressions. We don't talk to our best friends in King James vernacular. I hope we don't. Would thou like us to go to Tinseltown with us, me, to see a movieist? If you got friends like that, you got some weird friends. Trust me, baby. They wouldn't like it very much if we talked to them. I, I really don't think God is tied to 16th century King James vernacular. He wants to hear your heart. Your voice, your communication style, your very own is what pleases the heart of God. Thinking about in my own communication with God, I'm just being transparent. I know I'm guilty from time to time about praying with vain words. I'm guilty of praying things that I don't even think about. And I'm not trying to strain out a gnat and swallow a camel here. But I pray something like, oh God, please be with Trina today. Oh Lord, go with Scotty and Morgan on their trip. Now, I'm not saying that praying that is on the level of the seven deadly sins. I'm just saying it may be, there may be a more effective way to pray. And it's, it's, it's definitely a bad habit, I think, mindless repetition, because you know what? God's already promised he's going to be with Trina. He's already promised he's going to go with, with Scotty and Morgan on that trip. I am with you always, even to the end of the day. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you in some I'm saying, I'm praying something he's already promised. Maybe I, what I should pray, God, make Trina more aware of your presence today. God, make, make Ryan, help, help Ryan know, feel your nearness today. I know you're already with him, Lord, but just remind him of how awesome and great you are in his life. Maybe that's more effective. Think about all the ways, things we say because we just said that all, the way, all our lives. We said it that way. Or we've heard others say it like that. We're just repeating what we've heard them say. Think of all the things that we mutter in prayer that are old and stale and musty words. And honestly, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. Oh God, hallelujah. What are we praying? Come on, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. I'm telling you, I'm guilty. I'm just saying old, mindless, stale words that we've used for 25 years. Why don't you just start to, to bless the Lord and tell him how wonderful he is in your life. And God, you're the most awesome thing that I've ever known. Your salvation is, come on, just start talking to God like you talk to your best friend. But we get into mo- rote and mechanical things that just kind of roll off our lips that don't require any thought whatsoever. I just wonder if that really blesses God's heart at all. God wants us to pray with sincerity. And while we're on the subject of being real, God's not intimidated with, you, intimidated with you being honest with him. I mean, I think really God wants us to be open and honest. As a matter of fact, the greater the honesty, I think God likes it more. He likes it real, straight from the heart. God put on flesh and blood, moved into the neighborhood so he could identify with you and me. I think openness and raw honesty were at least part of God's affection toward David. When you read the Psalms, David just puts it out there. If he doesn't like it, he kind of tells God. God, he says, God, you know what? I've been doing everything I know to do and it doesn't seem to make a difference at all. It's quiet up there. Are you hearing me, Lord? Where are you? Do you see what's going on down here? That's kind of how David prays. Another time he says, you know what, Lord, I've been noticing some things. Some people don't, don't, don't serve you. They don't even like you, as a matter of fact. And you, they've been prospering, and here I am just struggling. Doesn't make any sense. Just kind of ticks me off, God. That's the way he prays. And I wonder if God looks down from heaven and says, wow, that is so refreshing. I love that. Every time I got praise, I'm going to listen. But he ain't saying, hello, God. He prays about his enemy. Lord, bless them, Lord, bless them. Bless them with a brick. Bless them with a brick. Wipe them out, God. I just want you to know, God's not intimidated with your honesty, you being real and praying from your heart. Well, well, Brother Tom, I just don't, sometimes I just don't know what to say to God. Well, just tell him what's on your heart. 
but sometimes afraid. Well, you tell him you're afraid. Say, God, right now I'm afraid about this particular set of circumstances I'm looking at. Lord, I don't even know how to pray about it. But I just want you to know, God, I'm afraid. And what I really need, Lord, is some peace about this. I just need some peace. So, Lord, please come fill my heart and mind with your peace. Settle my anxious thoughts. I can remember when I was battling severe voice problems. If you're a guest, you probably think I got severe voice problems right now, but um, I had real bad voice problems back in the day, 20, 20 years ago maybe. I'd preach on Sunday all day, and then by Monday at noon or one or two o'clock, I was still like this. Hey, can you call me back? I can't, I can't really talk right now. My voice was shot. And I can remember praying for God to heal my voice. It was a long time coming. There was a lot of frustration and fear and doubt and you name it, I experienced it. But I finally came to the place in my faith that I was able to pray to God, God, if you never see fit to heal my voice, I still declare you're the healer. If you still, if you never see fit to heal me, Lord, I will always serve you. I know I can trust you with my life. And I can remember the Old Testament Job, scripture from Job that said, even if he slays me, I'll still trust him. And we know God's not gonna slay us, but there's still that reality that says no matter what happens, You've got my heart, God. I'm gonna always follow you. I don't always understand. There, I don't always understand. There's more pieces missing to the puzzle. I can't figure it out. I can't get it all compartmentalized. I can't make it all add up. But I just want you to know, God, even though it doesn't work out the way I think it should, I still trust you. I know you're in control. Charles Spurgeon it was who wrote this, God is too good to be unkind and too wise to be mistaken. When you cannot trace his hand, you can always trust his heart. God's heart for you is beyond anything that you could think. His love, his grace, Calvary demonstrated God's heart for you. So pray frequently, pray in private, pray with sincerity, and finally, pray targeted prayers. Get specific with God. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Call those names out that you're praying about. Pray targeted prayers. One day, Joe, Bob, and Dave were hiking in a wilderness area when they came on a raging, violent river. They needed to get across to the other side. They stood there trying to figure it out for three or four hours. Seemed like a day. And finally, Joe decided, I'm going to just pray. And so Joe prayed, please, God, give me the strength to cross this river. And it was like the incredible hall. Boom, 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 boom. Muscles popping out everywhere. T-shirt rips off of him. He got big old muscles. He dives in that river and just Swims his way across, only, almost down, down three times, but he got to the other side. Dave saw this and he said, well, shoot, I'm gonna pray. Please, God, give me the strength and the tools to cross this river. And bam, right there's a rowboat. He pushes out the edge, jumps in and starts rowing, rowing, rowing. He almost capsized four or five times, but after he got over the other side, he, he wiped the sweat from his brow and said, thank you, Lord, you got me here. Bob had standing on the shore and he saw how it worked for the, rest, the other two, so he just prayed too. He said, please God, give me the strength, give me the tools and give me the intelligence to cross this river and boom, God turned him into a woman. Woo, that quick. <laughs> she took a map out, walked 100 yards north, crossed the bridge. <laughs> Come on ladies, anybody in the room today? Man, we guys, we don't like your directions. I know where I'm going. But we need a woman in our lives. You know, the more direct your prayers, the greater the faith that's displayed because when you pray with a definite target in mind, it's like telling God, I really think you're gonna answer this. I wanna give you all the details, God. I want you to know, I want you to tell, know all the details. So when you do answer, I'll have the greatest chance of unfolding the way I dreamed. And sometimes God goes all the way around all our details and answers in some better way than we ever dreamed or planned. But the more specific, the more likely you're praying with faith in your heart. Otherwise, maybe you just throw a prayer up, oh, God help me today. Maybe you don't really believe that God's gonna come through. Lord, just bless me. I, I, I don't know if it's gonna happen. Just, just bless me, Lord. Or maybe you can pray. Lord, I've got some clients I'm meeting with at two o'clock on Monday. And I'm asking you to give me the ability to communicate the product that I'm selling. Give me a connection, Lord, with this, these decision makers. And help me in, in humility to be able to articulate what I wanna say to them about this product. I really need this account, Lord. Give me the wisdom and the knowledge to answer any question that they might ask. 
and the power to be real in my own heart so I can communicate with truth, integrity, and character. And that's a targeted prayer. You start praying prayers like that, you're gonna see some cool answers. Watch God begin to infuse your life with his grace. See, God's got an awesome adventure for us in prayer. I, I wanna challenge you to put away your dusty, dry speeches and form some prayer priorities. Find the time and the place if you miss it. Hey, I miss it sometimes, but get back on track tomorrow. Pray specifically from the heart and watch God work. We've got a good God that wants to demonstrate his power in our lives through prayer. I, I'm not saying you gotta do it like I do it. There are plenty of people in this church that teach me tons about prayer. But sometimes I often journal, I always take a notebook with me in prayer and sometimes I write out a prayer, something that I'm praying about, things I'm asking God about. I can tell you not long ago, I was just kind of leaping through an old prayer journal. I was looking for something else and happened upon this crude map that I had drawn of all the blocks around this property where you see all these parking lots, where this building sits. I don't know, unbelievable amount. Seven acres worth right across from City Hall. I'd drawn this crude map, I'd, I'd drawn the blocks, block 10, square 10, square 11, lot one, two, 12 lots in each block. And I'd been praying over that and praying over that. And I look back and I see what God has done. Amazing goodness, something that no, nobody in this church was wise enough to get done, but God who answers prayer came through at just the right time. I can remember I, I, had, I had in there a place where I was praying about Ruston. Now we've got a thriving church in Ruston. Thank God for our Ruston family and our Ruston community. We praise God for you. We love you guys. Praying about Stolen in the same way, and now we've got a thriving church in Stolen. Thank God for his work among us. Prayer brings answers. Answers. I will tell this on myself. I, I remember driving by the Chase building, Chase Bank, and I said, boy, I'd like to have that building. And then I said these terrible, idiotic words, uh, that'll never happen. After all that God had already done, I said, it'll never happen. And that quick, God came through, the property went for sale, we, we raised some money, we paid that thing off. $1.5 million in two years, that debt was gone. Praise God, you think God doesn't hear and answer prayer? He's in your corner, he's in your court. He wants to see you prosper in his grace. Thank God, thank God for his faithful. I just want you to know that prayer works, that prayer is important, that God answers prayer. Don't waste another day, it's time to pray. Can you say amen? amen? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap again this morning. <laughs> Praise your name, Jesus. Amen. Bow your heads with me right where you are. Our elders and prayer team are getting ready to serve you. Listen, this is the most sacred, holy moment of the day. Your movement will disturb somebody who's trying to make an eternal decision. So I'd ask, if you're not on a serve team, we've got a few serve team members need to move. I'm just gonna ask you, if you will, let's honor the Lord right now and not disturb somebody near us. Bow your head, will you, right now, where you are? Movement is limited, please. The most important prayer that you could ever possibly pray is a simple prayer like this. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. And listen, you, you may be on the top of the world in your career. You may be living in your dream house, the 401 K is fully funded, kids are doing great. Maybe you got some in high school or college. Marriage is intact and wonderful and prospering and flourishing. You're at the top of your income level and you know something's missing. Can I tell you what it is? You need Jesus, you need Jesus. Or maybe today you're, or you gotta look up to see bottom. Your financial legs have been cut out from under, your kids have gone off the rails your marriage is in shambles. You need Jesus. So to ask you right here, Rustin Stolen, right here at West Monroe, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder if you're here today and you know in your heart of hearts, man, I need to make an advance toward Jesus. I need to give my life to the Lord. I need to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sinful past and start on a new journey with him. 
Are you here right now? And you be bold and strong. Just throw your hand high in the air. Let me see them. Hold them high. Wherever you are, across this room. Keep them up. Let me see where you are. Thank you. Thank you for raising your hands. Sterling and Rustin, follow suit. Thank you. God bless you. Put your hands down. I want you to pray a simple prayer with me right now. Would you pray this simple prayer as our elders and prayer team are joining us at the front? Lord Jesus, come on, everybody out full voice. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. I believe today that you're the Son of God, that you died to pay for my sins, making a way for me to experience your joy for all eternity. Today, I commit my life to you and give you my everything. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, would you celebrate what God's done right now? We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Come on, church, stand to your feet right now. If you need to come pray, you have a prayer need, you wanna come tell somebody what Jesus did in your life, do that, make that overture, stretch your hands toward heaven. Let me pray us out today. Father, I speak the blessing of heaven over your sons and daughters. The goodness and grace that flows from the river of God saturate our lives, Lord. Make us everything you've called us to be. Help us to tap in, lean on, lean into the power of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, Christ Church. You're dismissed. Still time to come for prayer this morning.